Welcome everyone to tonight's lecture recital and world premiere. This project is a presentation and performance of the first Nigerian one woman opera. Based on the initial folktale of The Farmer's Son Becomes a Hunter, which I rewrote to be The Farmer's Daughter Becomes a Musician. This project titled Decolonizing and Enriching Opera highlights and discusses the work of the Nigerian classical composer, Dr. Ayo Oluranti, with libretto by Miracle Ogbo. It features a newly adapted version of the classical Nigerian folktale, Omwagbe to Do Olorin. The farmer's daughter becomes a musician. The narrative illustrates some of the difficulties classical musicians encounter, such as fear, pressure, that their audiences never see. Additionally, it emphasizes the limitations of non-musicians who look at a musical career from an extremely simplistic perspective, addressing such assumptions that musicians solely sing and do nothing else. For centuries, opera has stayed very close to its origin, deeply rooted as a white European art form. Yet, opera expressions exist all over the world. As a black African woman, I'm often asked about my vocation as an opera singer. People both new and familiar often respond with disbelief or even derision, saying things like, so you sing white people music? But you're black. That's a white man's world. How do you survive? Do you get hired at all? Why are you singing white people's music when you could focus on popular and jazz music? I'm sure it pays better. Or simply, I don't know what that is. Unfortunately, these responses capture the simple fact that opera has not meaningfully evolved and expanded beyond the white European frame for centuries. The repertoire performed in major opera houses around the world continues to highlight the canonized white European paradigm. By privileging the white and Euro European canon, Opera is seen as a site of colonialism. According to Maldonado Torres in his 2007 article titled On the Coloniality of Being, Cultural Studies. Coloniality instead refers to a long standing pattern of power that emerged as a result of colonialism, but that defined culture, art form, labor, intersubjective relations and knowledge production well beyond the strict limits of colonial administration. In this case, opera is the art form with long-standing patterns of Europeanism. This project is a decolonizing effort to introduce Yoruba language into a traditionally European art form. Decolonizing and enriching the opera does not mean that European opera should no longer be performed, but that it is time to expand our roots to more languages, nations, and continents. Opera is an art form that was constructed in the depths of class privilege. For most of its history, it was supported by monarchs, aristocrats, and wealthy patrons. Haydn was financed by a prince. Mozart and Beethoven were supported by a baron. Wagner backed up by a king. Stravinsky and Copeland endowed by an heiress. An example of problematic depictions of blackness in opera is the role of monostatos in Mozart's magic flute. Being black, monostatos, the overseer of Zarastro's temple, is not to be trusted and has dark and evil tendencies. He appears in most productions as grotesque, dirty, buffoon-like, incapable of being truly loved by another. Today, the genre is still claimed on a historical lack of diversity. This historical and economic discrimination has birthed countless diversity dramas, including paradigms of classism, primitivism, orientalism, exoticism. These paradigms have been used as an attempt to understand a foreign or different culture but is stuck behind a white European lens and does not allow for the transparency of the full depths of other cultures. 
Unfortunately, these trends have been embraced and canonized in the opera genre. In recent years, most researchers have authored articles, blogs, book chapters that have stirred up dialogues about white predominance in different facets of the classical music genre. In 2021, public and heinous acts of bigotry towards black and Asian lives being lost inside it, the rise of the Black Lives Matter and the Stop Asian Hate Movement. More white Americans than ever are now paying attention to racism in a way that has found its way into the upper world. The driving questions for those who believe this reckoning is long overdue are, how long will this push for diversity last before reverting to traditional European canons? How far reaching will change towards equity go before movements wear out and we return to the previous status quo of discrimination? What are we as musicians and scholars in opera doing to set the seal for more diversity, equity, and inclusion? Aligned with the decolonial aims of this project, this English and Yoruba language opera promotes an international understanding of Africanopratic styles, which reflect literary, musical, instrumental, and dance cultural traditions. This project also addresses some of the issues faced by people of color in the upper world, ways that people of color have been resilient in this genre, and ways to enrich the upper world with the aim of decolonizing and deframing the white racial structure. This performance showcases the use of the Yoruba language of Nigeria for the song sung by the soprano soloist, intermixed with English dialogue and narration. There are seven unique elements of this opera. These are the Yoruba language, the Yoruba festivals, which is the setting for the entire opera, the intricacy of Yoruba proverbs, the Oriki, which is a praise poetry, the dance traditions, other non-Western genres of music like the high life and Afrobeat music, and of course, the African percussion instruments. The Yoruba language is a tonal language because the words define tone like pitches in music. This makes it difficult for non-native speakers to understand and speak the language. Hence, for it to be understood, Nigerian classical composers do not only consider the Western rules of harmony and structure, but they also need to consider the tonal inflection of the language. This international and masterful expansion of the white European protocols is a decolonizing practice that enriches the art form. For example, the word ogun has several meanings based on the tonal inflection and also based on the context. Ogun, with two low tones, means medicine or charm based on the context. Ogun, with one middle tone, with two middle tones, sorry, means war. Ogun, with one middle tone and one high tone, means 20, could also mean an inheritance based on context. The richness of the Yoruba culture can be experienced through these festivals. This is one of the reasons why this opera is set in the scene of an ongoing festival. Sometimes this festival attracts tourists, spectators, and Nigerians living abroad. They are sometimes used to generate income by the government. Most festivals consist of performers, dancers, musicians, drummers, and community members who watch from a distance and sometimes join in the dancing and singing. The participants of the festival parade from one place to another, singing and dancing. Depending on how elaborate the festival is, this is decided by the community chairman and the community members. But depending on how the com they, they decide to go with the festival, sometimes this festival go on for a couple of days and weeks and could lead to the shutting down of major roads in order to accommodate the festival's display. These festivals highlight the richness and depth of the community's history and culture. Some well-known Yoruba festivals are the Eyo Festival, Oshun Oshogbo Festival, Shongo Festival, Oju Deoba Festival, Olojo Festival, Oro Festival, to mention a few. 
Now to Proverbs. To the Yoruba people, the use of Proverbs is the most effective way to offer advice to one another. Proverbs are their distinctive way of dispensing wisdom in all of their life situations. The Yoruba people are also well known for their usage of Proverbs to resolve issues such as love, hatred, and pleasure. The use of Proverbs is not a phenomenon unique to one culture. Rather, it is a worldwide phenomenon that tries to address societal changes. There are a wide variety of Proverbs that can be found throughout the world in many languages and cultures, all of which can be utilized to impart wisdom to those who hear and comprehend them. Proverbs, on the other hand, are so thoroughly woven into the Yoruba society that nearly everyone who is fluent in the language is a natural proverbialist. In light of this cultural and moral significance, Proverbs are viewed as a conversational condiment that enhances communication. In the finale, we find the words, Ibiti anlo lanwo, a kiwo ibiti ati shubu, ibajenio kudashe uluwaduro, which means we focus on where we're going, not where we had fallen. The wickedness of man cannot stop the work of God. Next element, the oriki. Oriki is a culturally significant tradition within the Yoruba communities, which can be translated in various ways, including praise poem, song praises, praise names, attributive names, titles, and verbal salutes. The Yoruba tradition of religious praise and attributive appellations is portrayed by their custom of reciting oriki to honor people. This is an oral tradition passed down through generations. Oriki is divided into four major categories based on the recipient of the praise. Oriki Orile is sung to family members. Oriki Ilu is sung for community members. Oriki Najide for prominent people, either dead or alive. The last Oriki is the Oriki Orisha, which is a praise song to a living ruler or public figure. Being a specialized art form, Adebo Wale Daud or Lamide, a specialist of Yoruba language and Oriki, wrote the text for the Oriki Orisha, featured in the, fi in the final scene where Ayomide, my character, praises King Alafoni. Thank you. One unique feature of this opera is the opening percussion overture and the finale that showcases dancers. This could be seen from the lens of Europeanism as similar to the introductory ballet dance in the French operas. However, in Nigeria, it is ubiquitous to find a passerby dancing lightly or nodding their head to music being played in the background or in the middle of the street broad daylight. More so, during festivals, African drumming and dances are displayed and performed at market squares, intersections between streets, or on the roadside. In every ceremony, there are special significant dances that are performed. These dances are also presented as special performances at significant royal and king coronations. Here is a practice video of the choreographers Shion Usman and Abigail Tonade, who helped choreograph the dance for sending, by sending the videos for the opera from Nigeria. <laughs> Now 
we go to the mu new musical genres. This opera also showcases two genres of African music that cannot be seen in the European or white operas. One is high life music and the other is Afrobeat. The birthplace of high life music is widely regarded as being in Ghana, notably in the 19th century. High life music was an intentional break from the waltz, foxtrot, and cha-cha ballroom dances. In the 1930s, high life music gained popularity inland and westward along the coast, gaining a particularly big following in Nigeria. Therefore, high life underwent a significant transformation with its asymmetrical drum rhythm drawn from the Yoruba people and their drumming techniques. And these were blended with syncopated displaced accents with the guitars and the melodies to accompany songs spoken in Yoruba or in English. Here is the opening chorus from the finale showcasing high life music. Now, Afrobeat. Afrobeat is an amalgamation of Yoruba music, Western African high life, free jazz, and funk that was popular in the 1960s and 1970s. Fela Kuti, a Nigerian artist known for his eccentricity, musical prowess, and involvement in post-colonial African politics, is credited with coining the term Afrobeat. Musical elements such as chanted vocals, intricate intersecting rhythms, and percussion were intertwined with social and political commentary. Fela's long-winded and theatrical concerts were at least 10 or more band members, including polyrhythmic beats with counsel for young Africans to defeat their oppressors in the post-colonial era. Fela encouraged other Africans to become self-sufficient and to challenge oppressive power systems as African states recognized following liberation. Here is a short example of Afrobeat music titled Tintinto Janto from scene two, where Ayomide gets her mojo back, inspired by a bird singing. <laughs> The last, but definitely not the least element, is the African percussion instruments. Some African musical instruments employed in this opera were the shekere, the akuba, the agogo, and the iyailu, which is the mother of the talking drum family. A vital role of the talking drum is to praise a king or honor the traditional tribal leaders. It is also used for accompanying dances, religious chants, and traditional festivals. In former times, it was used as a means of communication and sending coded messages. The musical sentences produced by the drummers could be philosophical, comical, and sometimes sarcastic. It could also be used to give advice, criticism, and to pray. The drum tones are the same as we hear in the Yoruba language, with exclusions of the consonants. This means 
that the proficiency of the drummer in Yoruba language is a necessity for a successful performance. The drummer incorporates the tonal features and pitches of the Yoruba music or the Yoruba language into his technical drumming sentences. Here is an example from the percussion overshore where the Iyailu, the talking drum, echoes Ayomide. Ayomide o! Omo olu wa sheyi o! Lulu fun o! Kori fun o! Ki won gba kwe baba re lo lo rin! Now, solutions. While opera has existed since the 16th century, it is only now that discussions about diversity, equity, and inclusion are transpiring. Though segregation has been present for a long period of time, the world becomes more and more aware of the repercussions of racism, injustice, and discrimination as a response to the Black Lives Matter and Stop Asian Hate movements. However, there's still a lot of work to be done to effect change and allow the evolution of opera in other countries and continents to be seen and heard around the world. For opera to be properly decolonized and inclusive, one basic but yet important thing to do is to allow openness for inclusion. As simple as that sounds, opera Sorry, as simple as that sounds, one major problem in opera is that people lack an openness to explore the fields and to explore new places and, and cultures. To have a decolonized and enriched opera experience, we need to allow openness for diversity, equity, and inclusion. We also need to acknowledge that opera has a whiteness problem. We need to avoid tokenistic approaches we need to effectively deconstruct the canons. Try to teach variety of opera or practic works in schools and colleges and address issues of racism, cultural discrimination, and primitivism. In conclusion, if an operatic version of Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream were to be created, it would proceed as follows. I have a dream that one day, black, indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC individuals, would perform on several stages without being judged because of their accent, or their heritage, or origin in other minority cultures. I have a dream that opera will not only be sung in European languages or in English, but also in several languages of the world that opera performed on main stages of the world, like the Met, La Scala, the Royal Opera House, Prague State Opera, Sydney Opera, Teatro di San Carlo, and Paris Opera, will showcase several cultures, languages, and composed works. I have a dream that racism and segregation in opera will be no more and BIPOC individuals will not be treated as second-class citizens in the field, that institutions in opera will be created to address issues of racism in opera, and BIPOC individuals will have a platform upon which to thrive and not to strive. I have a dream that paradigms and canons will be established in opera, canons of diversity, inclusivity, and equity will be established in opera. I have a dream that colonialism, primitivism, exoticism, and classism will be in the past. These isms will be addressed in classrooms, and students will be more sensitive and aware of how these have affected opera and the efforts that have been made to cause a change. Thank you.
And come all, gather round, for it is time to tell the tale of the great Ayomi Day. Listen closely as I bring you on this journey, for our story begins in the village of Afoni with the Oluwasheyi family. Ayomide's father, Adebayo, wants nothing more than for his daughter to live a good life and be happy, but tradition teaches him there is only one way. However, she has other plans as we center in on our hero and her humble beginning. Ayo! Ayo! Ayomide! Ayomide, Oluwashe! Are you wearing those headphones again? No, 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 sir. I'm sorry, Dad. I was just listening to the song that you want us to record at his studio tomorrow. Well, I was shopping, of course. You're recording tomorrow? Ayo, you can't go tomorrow. The festival has a few days left, and we're going to experience it all as a family. Bye. Don't but me. I know that you love music, but you cannot make a living as a musician in a phony. If you could, I would support you wholeheartedly. I have raised you to be a strong and beautiful woman so you can support your mother and I, as well as a family of your own. No man wants to marry a woman who cannot support him or his children. I love you, and I know you're wonderfully talented. But I would not be doing my duty as a father if I did not look out for your future, yes? Now, grab your things before your mother gets here. <laughs> what is going on here? We don't have time for Galivanti. We still have some cocoa yam to harvest, and I want to be back here before the festivities start. Actually, Mom, I can't. You can't what? What are you doing that you can't help your father and me? I have a meeting. I wanted to wait until later to show you, but I might as well just give it to you now. What is it? Are you pregnant? You spoiled child! You have killed me! Ew! Mom, no! Why would you even think that? You better not be! Where's my kabaka?
just beginning as she graduated from university at the top of her class. But the reality of the world was far different from her days as a mere student. Though her talent was plentiful, the people of Afoni did not have enough for her to make a living. Celebrations became less and less frequent until Ayomide could barely make ends meet. Thank you. 
She continued her journey home with so much joy in her heart. She didn't know for sure what was going to happen next or how it was going to happen, but she was convinced her life was about to change. When Ayomide got home, she immediately wrote down the song she heard the birds sing and made it into a beautiful song that everyone who heard her sing it would dance and invite her to sing it again. Ayomide's father and mother had indeed never heard such beautiful music and they broke out into dance. They danced